First gathering of a brand new year as a church family, that's pretty cool, right? And today we are beginning a brand new series called Further, so I could not be more excited. Uh, but before we get into that, I uh, figured we'd start here. It's a new year, so uh, how many of you are New Year's resolution people? No one in this room, New Year's resolution? A couple of you? All right, for the three of you that do it, have you, have you, you know what I'm asking next, have you already failed at your New Year's resolutions? We've had a week. Social scientists say something like 80% of people fail in their New Year's resolutions by February. Uh, so if that's you, just give it a few weeks and everybody else around you will be in the same boat and we'll, we'll all be back to the way we were. Uh, personally speaking, I'm not much of a resolutions person, but I do find it really interesting that our culture just kind of takes it for granted that something you should do at the beginning of every new year is begin to think about self-improvement. You see, resolutions, they kind of work on this premise that uh, my life is going somewhere. Uh, we have this sense that we're in a story that's not finished yet. And because we have this sense, it's as if there's, there's a future, better, different version of me out there somewhere in the future. And, and I could become that person. I could tell that story if only I began to do some things differently now. But what makes uh, resolution so interesting to me is that when many of us begin to pursue this uniquely different version of ourselves, uh, we reach for goals that are really similar to everybody else. We want to lose weight and get in better shape. You want to get better at your job, find a new hobby, travel more, improve your socioeconomic status. It's like, well, yeah, that's what everybody wants to do. And, and, and the interesting thing to me then about, about resolutions is, is it seems true that the, the more unique we are, to become the unique person that we envision for ourselves, we have to do some things that are pretty common to everybody. And, and this, is, this is a good thing. If, if you want to tell your unique story, you have to find a story that we all have in common, this unique story and this common story. And they seem at odds. It seems like it's a contradiction, but actually it's not. It's a good thing that there's never been another person like you in the history of the world and that you're a person like everybody else. It's a good thing that you have a unique story to tell and that your story is not the only one. In fact, it's, it's when we try to pull this dynamic apart that we actually run into problems. Let me give you this as an example. So one of the places that I feel this tension a lot in my life right now is as a parent. And uh, as cliche as it may sound, uh, I am constantly amazed at just how different my kids are, even at the young ages of two and four. We've, we've tried to raise them the same, do everything just about the same, but they are, they're different. My, my two-year-old loves her little green blanket and her stuffed doggy, and she will not go to sleep at night without both of them. My four-year-old, on the other hand, she doesn't care what blanket she uses, and she's really into cats right now. And we are patiently trying to work on that with her. <laughs> but as uniquely, different, as uniquely different and special as I think my kids are, uh, in other ways, they're, they're kids, like all the other kids. They love to watch television, and they hate to eat their vegetables. They love jumping on my couches, and bedtime is a fight to the death. And that's a good thing. Despite how much I... I complain about it. These, these are good things. It's good that my kids are not the only ones like them. It's good that they're not the only ones who learn and grow and develop in the way they do. It's a good thing that there are a lot of other kids out there that enjoy musicals or else no one would have written Moana and I wouldn't get to hear my kids sing How Far I'll Go at the top of their lungs in the car, right? And the point is, my kids are, are both and this is what makes parenting so complicated. One of the most important jobs I have as a parent is, is to help them learn to see themselves as a person with a story to tell, to notice the things that make them different, to help them cultivate all those things that make them so unique. But what a catastrophe it would be if that's all we ever did. See, we have to graft them into a story that is much bigger than their own story. They need, they need a way to make sense of their story. But we have to do that in such a way that we don't diminish or, or destroy all of those beautiful things that make them so unique. And that's the dance, trying to hold these two things in tension without losing our hold on either one. 
And actually, I think something like that is, is true for all of us in this room and watching online. Whether you're talking about the small changes you want to make at the beginning of a new year or the big changes like growing from childhood into maturity, we need both stories. We need both in order to make sense of our lives. We need both in order to experience the fullness of life. You need a strong sense of your own life story, who you are, how you're wired, where you're going, what you're after, what season you're in. You need to know those things. But if this is all you had, you will really struggle in your life to answer questions like, am I okay? Is my life moving in the right direction? Am I a good person? Am I good enough? Answers to questions like that require us to find something bigger than ourselves, a story that we all have in common. Otherwise, you're just kind of making it up as you go. And there is no more reliable way to make a mess of your life than to just make it up as you go. Conversely, though, if this is all we have, then it's easy to begin to feel like you're just a cog in the machine, like you are just an accident of time and chance. And you're really going to struggle to answer questions like, does my life matter? Do I have any purpose? Will it make any difference whether I'm here or not? Human beings need a bigger story within which to find ourselves in order to flourish. Joe Frost says it this way. She says, man is a teller of tales. We live our lives as if they are a story, and we live our lives as if we are in one. But the smaller the story, the less capable it is of holding the weight of a whole human life. There is a bigger story, and there is a better story that we are invited to participate in. It is rich, deep, complex, and we need that whole story to make sense of our lives. If we can find ourselves within that story, she says then we can start to glimpse what it means to be truly human. We need both because we are both. Your life, my life, it is a story within a story. And that's what this series is all about. For the next couple of months, we are going to be talking about your story It's highs and lows, critical moments, opportunities, challenges, the beginning, the middle, the end. We're going to talk about your story. But the only reason we're able to talk about your story in a room this size and it makes sense to everybody is because, in a sense, your story is a story that we all have in common. And as G.K. Chesterton once said, if there is a story, there is a storyteller. And so our goal today is just to kind of set the context of where we're going to be going for the next couple of months. And and I can think of no better way to start the year 2024 off, to start this series off, than to simply fix our eyes on the author of the story that makes sense of every single one of us. Talking, of course, about the God of the Bible, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Admittedly, this can be a difficult thing to talk about. That God is Trinity is one of the most fundamental claims of the Christian worldview. It explains our view and understanding of the character and nature of God. It explains so much about our understanding of the nature of reality. And yet, the idea of God as Trinity is is intimidating for, for many of us. It's confusing for many of us, if we're honest. Fortunately, we don't have to resolve all of that today. We don't have to convince ourselves that even if we wanted to, we could unravel all of the mysteries of God. We don't have to do any of that because God has revealed himself to us. And it's what the triune God has revealed to us that has the deepest relevance for the story of our lives. Christopher Watkin writes, the Bible, the biblical God is one God in three persons, meaning that relationship is part of the fabric of reality right from the beginning. Not something that enters the story of this universe later on. God was not all alone on a pre-creation island, only afterwards entering into relationships. His being is relational from before the very beginning. But in the beginning, this God, this relational triune God, created the heavens and the earth. These are the familiar words that begin the Bible. 
the first revelation of God in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created everything. All of creation is the good and intentional result of the creative activity and the personal love of the triune God. All of it, everything is part of one story, God's story. And in God's story, he created human beings, male and female, in his image. I know we talk about that idea all the time, so don't miss what that means. It means that value, identity, purpose, belonging, meaning, all of these things, they are yours as a gift. You don't have to earn those things or wonder about those things or question those things. They are given to you as a generous gift from the God who created you in his image. You matter if for no other reason than that you belong in God's story. This is so beautifully reflected in the poetry of Psalm chapter eight. Psalmist writes, Lord, our master, how majestic is your name in all the earth, whose splendor was told over the heavens from the mouth of babes and sucklings you founded strength. On account of your foes, you put an end to enemy and avenger. When I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you fixed firm, what is man that you should take note of him? And the human creature that you pay him heed, and you make him little less than the gods? With glory and grandeur you crown him? You make him rule over the works of your hands, all things you set under his feet, sheep and oxen all together. And also the beasts of the field, birds of the heavens and fish of the sea, what moves on the paths of the sea. Lord, our master, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is a beautiful, dignified picture of what it means to be human. But of course, that's not the only thing the Bible says about human beings. It turns out that we're not very good at playing our part in God's story. From the very beginning, in fact, we have struggled to live in the tension of two stories at once, doing just about everything imaginable to pull these two stories apart, and everything has gone wrong. And it kind of makes you wonder, why didn't God just start over? It's his story. Why not just tell a new one? If human beings are screwing up so badly, just tell a different story. But this is the story of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is in his nature to pursue, to reconcile, to heal, to love. And he will not simply abandon his creation. This relational dynamic in God's personality was first discovered by the children of Abraham, the nation of Israel, uh, who God made a special covenant with. And if you remember, uh, God makes this covenant with Israel so that through them, he can bless the whole world. In other words, he wants to tell his story through the lives and the stories of his people. But once again, everything goes wrong. And Israel's story, it, it unravels. As the Old Testament unfolds, it just unravels until finally they are lost completely in exile to other nations. And it kind of makes you wonder, why didn't God start over? It's his story. If he can't find faithful covenant partners in Israel, why not just pick a different group of people and start over with them? But this is the story of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is his nature to pursue, to reconcile, to heal, and to love. And he will always be faithful to his promises. But how? How is God going to get this story back on track? Well, what if God entered the story? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. These are the familiar first words of John's Gospel, where he introduces us to Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. And John 1, he goes on to say, life was in him. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. 
The true light, which gives light to every human being, was coming into the world. And the word became flesh and lived among us. We gazed upon his glory, glory like that of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And John's claim here is that in Jesus, in this one person, God's story and the human story are finally in perfect harmony, completely entwined and overlapping. And Jesus was what we were always supposed to become. Jesus is what we never did become. Finally, a perfect image bearer of God Finally, a faithful king of Israel who will lead his people into covenant faithfulness and unleash blessing to the nations. Finally. And we killed him. We killed him. Of course, this too was all part of God's plan. In fact, here's how Jesus describes his life in John chapter 12, just a few chapters later. The time has come, he said. This is the moment for the Son of Man to be glorified. I'm telling you the solemn truth. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains all by itself. If it dies, though, it will produce lots of fruit. It's like, really, Jesus? That's what it means for the Son of Man to be glorified? He continues, verse 27, Now my heart is troubled. What am I going to say? Father, save me from this moment. No. It was because of this that I came to this moment. Father, glorify your name. And comes the response, I have glorified it, came a voice from heaven, and I will glorify it again. This is kind of funny to me. That was thunder, said the crowd standing there listening. No, said others, it was an angel talking to him. And Jesus said, the voice came for your sake, not for mine. Now comes the judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler is going to be thrown out. I have come, says Jesus, to get the story back on track. And then he says this. And when I've been lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And then John gives us this little narrative addition. He said this in order to point to the kind of death he was going to die. This is really important. This is like ground zero for today. The fundamental claim of the gospel is not just that Jesus was the perfect image-bearing human as opposed to all of us who have screwed it up. The fundamental claim of the gospel is not just that Jesus was the faithful covenant partner of God as opposed to Israel who screwed it all up. The claim of the gospel is that Jesus is, in fact, all of those things, and he is all of those things on our behalf. In Jesus, God is getting the story back on track. Jesus himself, in this one person, is the redemption arc of the entire story that God is trying to tell. And Jesus can be that in your story, too, and in my story. But how? we might ask, how is God going to get my story back on track? Well, what if God entered your story? What if God entered your story? Listen to the Apostle Paul's reflections in Ephesians chapter 1 about what Christ or what God has done for us in Christ. He says, let us bless God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, the King, He has blessed us in the king with every spirit-inspired blessing in the heavenly realm. He chose us in him before the world was made, so as to be holy and irreproachable before him in love. He foreordained us for himself to be adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus the king. That's how he wanted it, and that's what gave him delight. So that the glory of his grace, the grace he poured out on us, in his beloved one, might receive its due praise. In the king and through his blood, we have deliverance. That is, our sins have been forgiven through the wealth of his grace, which he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the secret of his purpose, just as he wanted it to be and set it forward in him as a blueprint for when the time was ripe. 
His plan was to sum up the whole cosmos in the king. Yes, everything in heaven and on earth in him. In him we have received the inheritance. We were foreordained to this according to the intention of the one who does all things in accordance with the counsel of his purpose. This was so that we, who first hoped in the king, might live for the praise of his glory. And then Paul says this, in him you too, who heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed it, in him you were marked out with the spirit of promise, the holy one. The spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until the time when the people who are God's special possession are finally reclaimed and freed. This too is for the praise of his glory. A million things we could say about this passage, but I just want to draw your attention to one thing. Paul's claim in this passage is that the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, he indwells every single person who belongs to Christ by faith as a down payment of your future inheritance. In other words, the Spirit of the living God being with you, living in you, transforming you from the inside out, it is God's guarantee that your story matters, that your story is being redeemed, that your story is going somewhere. The Spirit of God is the means by which the Father has been meeting in people's unique stories throughout time and space, throughout all of history, and uniting these transformed people into one grand narrative. A story that began with creation and will not conclude until God is all in all. But as I said at the beginning, this series is really about your story. Uh, But I hope you can see now that it's actually impossible to tell your story without God. God is the reason that we have a unique story to tell. And God is the reason that we belong in a story so much bigger than ourselves. Now here's the really cool part. Because we are both, and because we need both, it doesn't really matter how unique your story is. Every single one of us, no matter how unique our story is, it it, it tends to follow a very common story pattern. When it comes to life with God, when it comes to spiritual formation, we all tend to encounter the same kinds of seasons, the same kinds of decisions, opportunities, temptations, challenges, crises, tends to be the same. And and followers of Jesus throughout the centuries have noticed this. And and one of the ways that they've tried to represent it uh, and help people along is through something that we now call stage theory. And stage theory is just the idea that because we all belong to a common story, we, we all tend to grow and learn and change in similar ways through really predictable ways And we tend to move through really clearly identifiable stages in our lives. Now, a couple caveats before we go any further. Um, Stage theory, uh, not in the Bible. But the idea of maturing through stages absolutely is. Give you a couple of examples. 1 Peter 2, 2. Peter writes, like newborn babes long for spiritual milk. The real stuff, not watered down. That is what will make you grow up to salvation. The writer of Hebrews says similarly, you know, by now some of you should have become teachers, but you need someone to teach you the basic elementary beginnings of God's oracles. You need milk, not solid food. Everyone who drinks milk, you see, is unskilled in the word of God's justice. Such people are just babies. Mature people need solid food. And by mature, I mean people whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. So again, they don't use the language of stage theory, but certainly the idea of moving through stages of maturity. Second thing, stage theory is not a formula, uh, but it is wisdom. And and what I mean here is uh, this stuff that we're going to be covering in in the weeks ahead, this is not a law of the universe. It's not required. This doesn't have to happen in your life. Uh, But it is a way, it's a way to helpfully and, and hopefully accurately represent the experience that followers of Jesus have had in life transformation for, for 2,000 years now. And we can learn from all of that wisdom and experience. Let's move to the third thing. Uh, stage theory is not linear, but it is directional. 
And a couple things in mind here. First is no matter how simple and clean and neat a theory or the picture I'm about to show you may seem, uh, life is never that clean and simple. Life is always a lot messier than any theory can suggest. This thing's not linear, but it is directional. We should be moving in a particular direction. But just because we're moving in a particular direction doesn't mean that we should see these different stages in terms of better than or less than. In fact, uh, I'm going to really encourage you in the weeks ahead not to think of these stages in terms of better than or less than, but instead to think of them in terms of movement and maturity. Every stage is different, to be sure. Some seasons are going to be more fruitful than others. Some seasons are going to be more enjoyable than others. But every stage matters because it all happens in the context of life with God. So caveats out of the way. Let me show you the paradigm that we're going to be working from in the next couple months and then uh, tell you why we like it. Uh, You probably can't see this, and that's okay. Uh, But this is from uh, The Critical Journey by um, Hagberg and uh, Gulick. And they uh, identify six stages of spiritual formation. The first is the recognition of God. Second stage is what they call the life of discipleship. The third stage is the productive life. The fourth stage is the journey inward. Between four and five is something they call the wall, and we're going to get into that in the weeks ahead. Stage five is the journey outward. And stage six is what they call the life of love. Now, what all those stages mean, how they work together, what it means for you, That's the subject of the next couple of months. Uh, For today, I just want to tell you why we like this paradigm, why I have found it personally helpful, and why our leadership team believes it's going to be beneficial for uh, this church family. Uh, And the first reason is this. I think this paradigm really helpfully illustrates that all of life counts. One of my favorite quotes ever is from a guy named Dallas Willard. And he says that God is not interested in something called your spiritual life. God's just interested in your life. And the thing that God gets out of your life is the person that you become. And it's this beautiful reflection, I think, on all of life counts. All of life matters. It's all important to God. And the second thing that I think this paradigm is really helpful with and ones like it is that it illustrates the fact that formation in Christ takes a lifetime. I probably don't have to say this, but I will go ahead and say it. Uh, You are never done growing up into more of Christ. There are no shortcuts. There's no fast forward button. There's no seasons off. There is just the slow, methodical, deliberate, intentional work of becoming every single day. Robert Mulholland writes, spiritual formation is not an option. The inescapable conclusion is that life itself is a process of spiritual development. The only choice we have is whether that growth moves us towards wholeness in Christ or towards an increasingly dehumanized and destructive mode of being. The Christian journey is an intentional and continual commitment to a lifelong process of growth towards wholeness in Christ. It is for this purpose that God is present and active in every moment of our lives. That's why I've called this series Further. Because no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your faith story, no matter how your story is shaping up, the invitation to all of us is to come further up and further in to life with God. Further up and further in, that's uh, inspired by uh, the famous words of Aslan at the end of the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis. And if you're not familiar with that series, I, I love how Lewis ends uh, his final book uh, called The Last Battle. And these are, these are the final words of the series. He says, and as Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, the readers of these books, this is the end of all the stories And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, 
which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And Lewis here is drawing our attention to the final important point that I want to make to you today about the nature of stories. If they have a beginning, then they must have an end. Every story eventually comes to an end, including yours and including mine. But because our lives are caught up in a story that is much bigger than our own, uh, the end of our lives now is not the end of the story. It's really a lot more like the end of the prologue. And the whole point of the prologue is to set you up for the rest of the story. The prologue is not disconnected from the story. It's the context for the story. Which is why the invitation right now today, at the beginning of 2024, the invitation to you and to me right now is what it always has been and what it always will be. Come further up. Come further in. Come experience the fullness of life with God.